And now increasingly, the other end of the uh, life spectrum, the elderly, that is a becoming a more dangerous place to be. Dangerous for the elderly, dangerous for the poor, dangerous for the for people with disabilities. And the reason it's becoming more dangerous is because of physician-assisted suicide, or what I like to uh, I like to call it uh, doctor-prescribed suicide, because that's a more descriptive. Um, that's more descriptive of what's actually happening. As you can see, a, a PAS or physician-assisted suicide, doctor-prescribed suicide. The physician helps a person take his or her own life by writing a prescription for a lethal medication which allows the patient to commit suicide. So we're not talking about withdrawing treatment, we're not talking about taking people off life support, we're talking about a doctor who's supposed to be a healer writing a prescription to give to a patient to go home and kill himself. And these pills that they're taking to go home and kill themselves are usually a, a strong sedative called uh, cyclobarbital. And it's literally a bottle of about a hundred pills. And the person has to go home without any supervision and take these 100 pills to kill themselves. And there have been horror stories about people not actually dying. They go home, they start taking the pills, they throw up, they get sick, they don't get enough into them and so they suffer. There have been cases where people have taken these pills and lingered for about uh, two or three days and then wake up and wonder what the heck happened. So this isn't, isn't a nice, clean exit. And even if it were, this is a, a, a perversion of what medicine should be. It should be healing, not killing. So physician-assisted suicide is when a physician helps a person take their own life by writing a prescription. Euthanasia goes one step further. Euthanasia is more active, where the doctor uh, will actually push a medication onto a person, give that person an injection, so that person will die. And that, in places where doctor prescribed suicide or physician assisted suicide, where that has occurred, active euthanasia yeah, is something that always comes about. Um, and the act of euthanasia can be voluntary or involuntary. So in other words, a patient can say, Doc, will you give me an injection to kill me? Or in some cases, as is happening in Holland, for instance, the uh, doctors are giving this lethal medication without the patient's consent many cases. This is from a writer, Wesley Smith, in a book called Forced Exit, who describes this kind of evolution or devolution that I'm uh, describing. By the way, if you, if you have any questions along the way, just feel free to raise your hand if I'm not being clear or if you have any questions. But he writes in this book, Final exit. In only 23 years, Dutch doctors have gone from being permitted to kill the terminally ill who ask for it, to killing the chronically ill who ask for it, to killing newborn babies in their cribs because they have birth defects. Even though, by definition, they you know, babies cannot ask for it. Dutch doctors also engage in involuntary without significant legal consequences. Even though it's technically illegal, they've evolved in this deaf culture that nobody uh, brings legal consequences uh, against them. So you can see that doctor-prescribed suicide leads to involuntary euthanasia, leads to, uh, leads to voluntary and then involuntary euthanasia. And so there is a slippery slope from assisted suicide to legalize murder. So I'm going to be focusing on <coughs> doctor-prescribed suicide. And there's a lot of reasons why doctor-prescribed suicide is a dangerous thing. 
and I'm going to focus on uh, four main ones. First of all, <coughs> doctor prescribed suicide is dangerous because Hippocratic medicine is violated. How many of you know who Hippocrates is? Okay, so Hippocrates was a Greek physician. He lived 2,500 years ago, or 500 years <coughs> before Christ. And he recognized, in, in his culture, in the Greek world, the Roman world, doctors could either kill their patients or heal them. It was kind of their choice. If they thought there was no hope, they would kill them, either with or without the permission of the patient. And Hippocrates was ahead of his time, and he realized <coughs> that patients will not trust their doctor if they have the ability to kill them or heal them. And so he came up with the Hippocratic Oath which changed the course of, of medicine for the next 2,500 years. So I'll say a little bit about that as we go along. The other main argument or main reason to oppose doctor-prescribed suicide is because once that's legal, there will be pressure on the vulnerable <coughs> to choose death. The elderly, the disabled, the poor, Another reason why we should be opposing doctor prescribed suicide is because there will be pressure on physicians to violate their, their conscience. Because there is a requirement uh, in most of these laws that have passed, and I should say that physician assisted suicide is now legal in five states and Washington, D.C. It began in Oregon in the mid 1990s. And several years later, Washington State, and just recently, California. So now the entire West Coast has legalized doctor-prescribed suicide. A couple of years back, Vermont legalized it. Before that, Montana has a quasi-legalization because of a court case. And then, most recently, Washington, uh, D.C. has legalized. So it's creeping across the country, and this is really the Roe versus Wade of our time. You know, before 1973, when abortion became legal, the dominoes started to fall. Abortion became, abortion on demand was legal in California, and then New York, and then Massachusetts. And finally, the Supreme Court just said it's legal everywhere. And the fear is, is that the same thing might be happening uh, when it comes to doctor-prescribed suicide. And as it creeps across the country, these, these and, and this is, they've, they've come to Massachusetts about seven or eight times already, if not more. And every year, a bill goes before the legislature, and it's before the legislature again this year. And it was on the ballot, it was a ballot initiative uh, about uh, five years ago, and it probably will be again next year. So this is a really, hot topic and we need to all be in there to, uh, to fight against it. For these reasons and the pressure on the physicians, these, these bills require the physician to, if they don't, if they're opposed to killing the patient themselves or writing a prescription for the patient to kill themselves, they are required to transfer the patient to somebody who will. And so there is this additional pressure on physicians to violate their conscience. And when you get enough pressure from, from government to violate their conscience, pretty soon doctors who have consciences won't want to become doctors. They won't go into uh, medical school. It's just the kind of evolution that will occur where you'll have people who will kind of acquiesce to this sort of thing. The fourth uh, main thing that I'll focus on is that uh, if this becomes more prevalent, the overall suicide rate will increase. Not just doctor prescribed suicide, but in states where it is legal, like Oregon, like Washington, people look at that and say, well, this is a way to take care of problems. So if a person who's sick can go to their doctor and ask for a prescription to kill themselves, what about me? I'm sick in a different way. I'm depressed. Or I'm alone, I'm isolated, so if suicide is okay for them, why not for me? 
and the overall suicide rate is higher in states that have legalized physician assisted suicide. So let's go back to uh, Hippocratic medicine. Have you ever heard the term Hippocratic Oath? How many people have heard it? Okay, so the Hippocratic Oath is uh, an oath that was developed by Hippocrates because he lived in a death culture, much like we are becoming. And he spelled it out. He said, I will do, I will prescribe regimens for the good of my patients according to my ability and judgment and never do anyone any harm. This is the so-called first dictum of, of medicine. First, do no harm. And this, of course, is directly doing somebody harm. I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked, nor will I suggest such counsel. So we think this, this stuff is new. No, this stuff is old. This was going on in, in ancient Greece and ancient Rome that doctors were giving medicine to kill their patients. And Hippocrates said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to be a part of that. Because Hippocrates understood what we, as a culture, increasingly do not understand. That a physician cannot be both a healer and a killer and maintain trust of his patients. Doctor prescribed suicide puts pressure on the vulnerable to choose death. And I think this is the, the best argument we can use to try to beat back this uh, movement of doctor prescribed suicide. These are words I often hear in my office, particularly from the elderly. They'll come into my office and they'll say, say things like, I feel like giving up. I'm tired of living. Doc, don't get old. I don't want to be a burden. Now, depending on the mindset of, of the physician, these expressions can be taken down two entirely different pathways. It can either be taken down on a pathway of hope and encouragement when you hear things like this, or in the doctor prescribed suicide mindset, in that kind of a culture, it can be met with, yeah, you're kind of right, and uh, they can be led down the pathway of despair and abandonment. This person, her name is Kate Cheney. She's not a patient of mine. She was one of the original people who succumbed to doctor-prescribed suicide. She lived in Oregon. And she was taken by her mother. She, she had uh, cancer. She had terminal cancer. But she wasn't particularly suffering. And she was becoming a little bit demented. Her memory was going. And her daughter took her to see the primary care doctor and said, what do you think about assisted suicide for my mother? And the, and the primary care doctor said, we can't do that. Your mother doesn't even understand. She's not suffering, and your mother doesn't really understand. She's not fully with it to give consent. So what did the what did the daughter do? The daughter went doctor shopping. The daughter took the mother to the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist said, "No, she's really not in a position where she can understand what she's doing." Plus, he wrote in his notes that it looked like the daughter was being coerced, which she was. So she took her mother to a psychologist. And the psychologist said the same thing. So she's been to three doctors. All three doctors have said, now she really doesn't understand, she can't really ask for a doctor to prescribe suicide because she doesn't really know what that's about. So ultimately, the daughter took her mother to a, and get this, a managed care ethicist. In other words, somebody who worked for the insurance company who was supposedly an ethicist who could suggest, right, you know, could tell what's right or wrong for this particular patient. And this, and mind you, there's a conflict of interest because the insurance company is gonna save money if they agree that grandma here, that Kate Cheney, can kill herself. And sure enough, she said that she 
was with it enough that she could ask for this. And not long after that, she was given a lethal dose of medication and took it and died. This is another case of a patient in Oregon. This person's name is uh, Barbara Wagner. And Barbara was a 64-year-old who had lung cancer, who had it in remission. And she learned the disease had returned and would likely kill her. The last hope was an expensive drug that her doctor, pres that her doctor prescribed for her. The Oregon Health Insurance Plan refused to pay, but agreed to cover drugs for physician-assisted suicide, about 50 bucks. So you can be sure, if a, if a, if a treatment becomes uh, legal, it becomes, if a physician-assisted suicide becomes legal, it becomes a medical procedure, and it becomes a cheap medical procedure. And so insurance companies and governments have a financial incentive to kind of steer people towards suicide. So the Oregon, uh, the Oregon Health Insurance Plan is sort of like our mass health. It's the state Medicaid program. And so this, this lady, hoping to buy herself some time and, and uh, hold the cancer at bay, got a letter in the mail from Medicaid of Oregon, and it said, we won't pay for your expensive chemotherapy, but we will pay for your suicide pills. Imagine how you would feel if that happened to you, or your parent, or your grandparent. So insurance companies and governments see dying as a cost-saving measure, steering those with limited finances toward assisted death. Here's another Oregon resident. His name was Randy Stroop. He lived in Dexter, Oregon. He was a 53-year-old man who had prostate cancer. He, too, got a letter which said that his cancer was too advanced to warrant expensive treatment, but, was, but the state was willing to pay for his assisted suicide. This lady was from California. And she was a young woman, Stephanie Packer, in October of 2016 in California. She was a 33-year-old uh, wife and mother of four with scleroderma. Scleroderma is a nasty disease. It's an autoimmune disease where antibodies are directed at different tissues of the body, primarily the skin, hence the name scleroderma. Derma is skin, and sclera means, the, means scarring. So when people have scleroderma, their skin becomes gradually, becomes like leather, so it's hard for them to, to move. And not only can the skin be involved, but different organs can be involved too. And in her case, you can see that she's wearing oxygen. Her lungs were becoming like leather. Her lungs were becoming sclerosed. And she was gradually dying. The physician, uh, so at age 29, she was told she had three years to live, and the physician was going to be prescribing a different chemotherapy drug. But the medical insurance refused to pay, but was told that drugs to put her to death were covered for a co-payment of $1.20. You know, it's like, is it worth, oh, have we got a deal for you? We're going to give you a break. You're, this is like a cost you dollar twenty. Says, yeah, but I wanna but I wanna live. I want this expensive drug to help me live. Well, you know, we can't give you a Rolls Royce. We'll, we'll give you the uh, you know, the Volkswagen. This is uh, I have a, a couple of patients, and this is a story about a couple of patients of mine. I'll call them John and Martha, not their real name. <laughs> And this uh, picture of this elderly couple is not them, but it's, it could be. So I have this older couple in their 90s. And John had survived the Normandy invasion. So he comes into the office and he tells me sometimes about his war experiences. And he said that at age 19, he 
he was involved in in Norman in the Normandy invasion. You're familiar with that in 1944, World War II, the Allies invaded France to to uh, combat uh, the Nazis and to take back Europe. And when they landed, he was on a he was on a landing craft that ferried soldiers to the beach. And they went to the beach, and many of them were just cut to pieces. But eventually, they took hold and marched to uh, Germany and, and defeated the Nazis. But he was on that initial invasion, and he was manning this little PT boat. And he just he talked to me about there were German guns beyond the beach that were shelling all these boats. And he, he said there, was a, there were three boats down, that one got taken out, and then the next one got taken out, and then the next one taken, got taken out, and he turned to his crewmate, and he said, you know, I think we're next. And so he's 19, and, and the, his superior was a couple years older, 21. And he says, well, you got any ideas? He says, well, how about if we let out the anchor? So they let out the anchor, so there was some slack in the anchor, so the ship went about 100 yards toward the uh, ocean, away from the beach. And just as they did that, this shell landed right where he was, and he would have been annihilated. So here's, here's uh, somebody who uh, had done a lot of living at a very young age. Uh, and he and others like him are increasingly are, are going to be faced with the possibility that while well, you're, you're, no, you're no longer useful for us, we're going to put you on a, a road to Dr. Prescribe suicide. And that almost happened to his wife. Um, John, after the war, married Martha. They had two sons. The oldest son committed suicide many years ago when he was in college. Uh, and then, many years later, The uh, younger son committed suicide. He was in his 60s. So the son's wife died. The son became very depressed, and he killed himself. Now, this is about four or five years ago. Shortly after that, Martha was admitted to the ICU in atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a chaotic <coughs> heart rhythm, which is easily treatable. But if you don't treat it, it's terminal. So it could be considered a terminal disease even though it's easily treated. So she was tired and distraught, and she refused treatment in the ICU. So they said, okay, you don't want treatment, we'll put you on a morphine drip. And this was almost like doctor prescribed suicide. It, it, uh, it wasn't in the sense that a prescription wasn't written for. But she, and I should say that all of us have a right to withhold, to. Uh, <coughs> not receive care. Um, and in this case, she chose to not receive uh, care. And when I found out she was in the ICU, and the ICU doctor had put her on a morphine drip, I went and talked to her and I said, you know, I walked into the room and she looked at me and she said, Dr. Rolo, are you mad at me? And I said, no, I'm not mad at you, but you don't really want to do this. You know, she was depressed, she was distraught. But her husband still needed her, and, uh, and she still had some years to live. She's still alive now. And so after I would talk to her, uh, she decided to accept treatment. And now they're both, this was a couple years ago, and they're both at home, functioning independently, and um, still going. However, if physician-assisted suicide were legal in Massachusetts, which it wasn't at the time, there was a House bill, Bill 1991. If that had passed, Martha could have requested a lethal drug. A second opinion is required in these laws, but it's easy to get a second opinion. It's easy to get another hack physician to agree with you. And so a second opinion could have been gotten on the same day. These, law, these bills call for a psychiatric consult but they're not mandatory. And even if the psychiatric consultation occurred, the, the psychiatrist doesn't have to say, well, she's depressed, she can't be, be 
yeah, killed, all they, all they have to do is say, despite this person's depression, she understands what she's doing, so it is okay for her to take a lethal uh, <coughs> medication. So, if physician assisted suicide have, had been legal, instead of just putting her on a morphine drip and leaving her alone and see if she dies, they could have actively, or she could have requested uh, suicide and had it more, more quickly done. And if the, the, uh, dissent, if the doctor had dissented and didn't want to do that, this law, Bill 1991, that could have become law but didn't, stipulated that if the doctor didn't want to help this person commit suicide, the doctor had to transfer this patient to another facility who would do it. And furthermore, the doctor would have to pay for it. So you can see this, this uh, insidious pressure that's put on the medical profession. So the existence of a physician-assisted suicide would put pressure on the vulnerable to choose death. Anyone ever heard of Brittany Maynard? Brittany Maynard was a young woman who uh, became famous, was on the cover of People magazine. And in a highly emotional way, uh, the People, uh, an organization called Compassion and Choices, I'll get back to them later. But they publicized her as a woman who lived in California where it was not yet legal to uh, doctor prescribed suicide. So she moved to Oregon with the intention of killing herself because she had brain cancer, a grade four glioblastoma. Uh, John McCain, you know, Senator McCain, he was just diagnosed with the same kind of brain cancer. But she decided uh, under pressure from this pro-euthanasia group, Compassion and Choices, they, had some, they knew that this was going to be a well-publicized thing that would help their cause, so they helped publicize it, put her on the cover of People magazine. And uh, she went to uh, Oregon. And it's interesting because if you, look at, if you look back at that period of time in 2014, she said she was going to die, she was going to take these pills on November 1st. Well, it turns out in, 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 her, in her blogging, she was having second thoughts, and she was writing words to the effect that, well, maybe she wouldn't do this after all. And then the next thing you know, she was dead. So you kind of wonder what kind of pressure was put on her toward the end not to change her mind. And so she did ultimately take her life with the medication prescribed by a physician. This person that you probably haven't heard of, her name is Maggie Carner. And Maggie Carner had, is a young woman who had the same kind of uh, brain cancer that uh, Brittany Maynard did. And she said when this whole thing was being publicized, she lived in, she lived, uh, in Connecticut. I'm not sure if she's still living or not. But when this whole thing was uh, occurring with uh, Brittany Maynard, she said Brittany's suicide puts other patients like me at risk of abuse or subtle pressure to comply with state-sanctioned suicide. Another patient, this woman uh, on the uh, left, uh, Mary Ann Anselmo, uh, in, in March of 2015, she, who had the same kind of brain cancer that uh, Brittany Maynard had, went to Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City and tried an experimental drug, um, an immunotherapy, and it obliterated the cancer. And it probably will come back at some point and may already have. I, I tried to find out what was going on with her when I was preparing this, and I'm not sure what her situation was. Uh, <clears throat> but if we start killing people, who have these kind of cancers, we're going to miss out on finding new therapies to help people like this. So in her case, in, in Marianne Anselmo's case, uh, she had a, a, an initial very good response to 
the same kind of uh, brain cancer. So there's a danger of removing hope for a medical breakthrough if we legalize physician-assisted suicide. You know, the whole evolution of medicine, I believe, was a, to a large extent because of Hippocratic medicine. Because doctors forswore killing, they had, they were forced to try to find therapies for these people. And if they just killed them instead of trying to find ways, find medical breakthroughs to treat them, if, if uh, they had gone down the assisted suicide pathway, we never would have made the kind of breakthroughs that we've made in Western medicine over the last 2,500 years. When I saw this picture and I saw this little one, I, I thought of Charlie Gard. Remember Charlie Gard? He was the baby in the UK who recently died. Not assisted suicide. He, was, he had care withdrawn, but it's somewhat similar in the sense that this baby had a rare mitochondrial disease. The mitochondria are in all the cells of the body. They're sort of the, the engine, the energy source for all the cells of the body. And he had, his mitochondria was depleted. So he just gradually died. And since there were only, I think they said like 13 or 14 cases in the world, that had they, and they, the people of the, in the United States were willing to take little Charlie Gard to this country to treat him. So there could have been a medical advancement, not to mention the fact that these parents wanted it, and they wanted to move, and they had the finances to do it. But in the UK, they have socialized medicine. And when you have socialized medicine, like in the UK, like in Canada, our neighbors to the north, Parents aren't in charge. The state is in charge. Now, it's, it seems inconceivable. If you think of a little brother or sister going to the hospital and, the, and your parent saying, wow, we want, to, we want to take this person to this famous hospital over here to try to save him. And the government says, no, you can't do that. So when you, when you give power to the state, you get these unintended consequences. And if we give power to the state to refuse care, but to offer assisted suicide, we're talking about a very you know, similar situation. J.J. Hansen, if you can look at the bottom of the screen. J.J. Hansen, he had the same, the same tumor, another uh, glioblastoma. He's the president of the Patient Rights Action Fund the nation's leading organization protecting the rights of patients and people with disabilities by opposing assisted suicide legalization efforts. He's a, uh, a former Marine, and on the top of the screen he says, I was given four months to live. Assisted suicide isn't the answer. In 2014, former Marine J.J. Hansen had the same diagnosis as Brittany Maynard, a stage four glioblastoma multiforme. And he was treated with an experimental drug again at Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York. And despite being told he only had a few months to live, he uh, was still alive and is still alive today, even though his uh, cancer has uh, occurred. Um, so Hansen does not see assisted suicide as a choice that affects only the individual making it. Its influence on others should keep it illegal. Having the option to die will dishearten severely ill people, especially those who feel they are a burden to their families when they need to rally their courage. I mentioned a ballot initiative. In 2012, there was a ballot initiative in Massachusetts and it was question two on the ballot. Are you, do you want assisted suicide or don't you? And the, the uh, compassion and choices, the pro-euthanasia folks were targeting and continue to target Massachusetts. And with only a couple months to go before the election, the assisted suicide people were way ahead. And 
MCFL and other organizations, the Catholic Church, uh, disabilities groups, uh, they all converged together and worked together to beat this back. And physician assist question two failed. So doctor prescribed suicide in Massachusetts failed by just two points. We won 51% to 49%. So it was a big victory, but they're not going away. They're coming back, and it'll be on the ballot again next year. But if you look at the map, you'll see who favored it and who didn't. So the green colors are people who wanted a doctor prescribed suicide, and the pink are people who didn't. And I think this area probably falls uh, in, the, in the pink, right? So this area was pretty much against physician-assisted suicide. Well, look who is look who is in favor of it. Look at the green around the greater Boston area, the affluent suburbs of Boston. Look at the North Shore is green. Much of Cape Cod and the islands are green. Western Massachusetts is green. So it tends to be more affluent people who want this. And who's going to suffer? The people who are not affluent, the people who don't have the financial resources. So if you look at this other map, this kind of makes the point. These are areas of higher per capita income, which are shaded, in, uh, which are shaded uh, darker. So again, you see the, West, the Boston suburbs, the North Shore of Cape. Those are the affluent areas that wanted physician-assisted assist, uh, physician assist, suicide. And why? Because their choice will expand. They're wealthy. They have good insurance. So if they want to get treated, they can, they can do it. But if they don't want to get treated, they want the choice to have their doctor kill them. While the poor, they depend on other people. They depend on the state. They depend on insurance. But if, so if they get, so if assisted suicide becomes legal, the, the white, the wealthy, the well-insured, their choice will become greater, but the poor, the disabled, their choice will become less because they'll start receiving letters from insurance companies and from states saying, we're not going to cover this expensive cre treatment. We're going to cover physician-assisted suicide. So here's, here's a key point. I think this is the most important point we can make when we're trying to fight doctor-prescribed suicide, that laws that advantage the white, wealthy, and well-insured should not be made at the expense of the poor, people of color, the dispossessed, and the disabled. Because it will happen, it has happened, in Oregon, for instance, as I pointed out with people like Randy Stroop, Barbara Wagner, Kate Cheney, it's already happened. So moving on to what doctor prescribed suicide will do to doctors. It will put pressure on medical people to violate their conscience. Albert Einstein once famously said, never do anything against conscience, even if the state demands it. Well, that's, you know, a, a, uh, that's a good statement to make, but it's, uh, it doesn't take away the fact that that this pressure is out there, whether we uh, try to resist it or not. Again, I go back to Charlie Gard. There's, these, this, there's a baby, baby Charlie with his parents. And I often think, and this is a little bit different, this is, again, this was not an assisted suicide case, but this was pressure from the state not to treat this baby. You know, I, I, I try to imagine what it would be like for me if I was taking care of this baby. And the state, the government, was saying, no, you can't treat him, or you can't transfer him to a place that will treat him. What would I do? What does that do to, uh, to doctors um, who uh, want to be helpful but are pressured by the state not to do that, not to be Doctor prescribed suicide will increase the, suicide, the general suicide rate, and it has happened in 
the states where it's been legalized. So if you look at suicides, just general suicides, not doctor prescribed suicide, but general suicides among men and women aged 35 to 64, the national suicide rate from 1999, around the time it was legalized in Oregon, this was shortly after it was legalized in Oregon, if you look at the suicides from 1999 to 2010, nationally, the overall suicide rate increased by 28%. But in Oregon, where doctor-prescribed suicide was legal, it was almost double. So we're gonna we're giving people mixed messages. You know, there's there's a lot of information about there with hotlines for people to call if they're feeling suicidal, saying no. You, shouldn't be killing yourself and uh, let, let us help you. But on the other hand, when it comes to somebody who's uh, sick, we we'll say, yeah, that's all right. You can, you, know, you, you can go kill yourself. But these younger, more useful people, uh, we don't want you to kill yourself. Well, you know, uh, a person who's feeling depressed and suicidal, again, as I mentioned before, will look at the culture all around them where you know, assisted suicide is okay in a case like this, you know, why not a case like mine? So that it is proven to be the case that physician assisted suicide leads to an increase in the overall suicide rate. This is another graph just showing the same thing. The, um, the first vertical line here is when it was legalized in Oregon right around 1990, again, 96. And Washington State came late. And you can see the green line is the suicide rate from 1990 to 2010. And that recently, that's been going up. But it's not going up nearly as much as it is in Washington and in Oregon. So again, in places where it's legalized, the overall suicide rate Now the group uh, behind physician assisted suicide is a group called Compassion and Choices. That's their new, nice sounding, sanitized name. The, uh, their original name was a little bit more truthful. Their original name was the Hemlock Society. Now the Hemlock, Hemlock is a poison. So people early on figured out it's not really good PR to name your organization after a poison. You know, people probably won't take to that too well. So they changed their name to Compassion and Choices. But there's nothing compassionate, compassionate about uh, killing your patient. But they try to use two main arguments to try to push physician-assisted suicide. They'll say, we need to have this to avoid unbearable pain. But we have the best pain management in history. And when you ask patients reasons why they want, might want doctor prescribed suicide, it's way down on the list. It's around number six. Higher on the list are things like, well, I might consider doctor prescribed suicide because I'm not enjoying things anymore. I've lost the ability to take care of my own personal hygiene. I don't want to be a burden to my family. Basically what we're doing by legalizing physician-assisted suicide, we're agreeing with them. We're saying, yeah, you, you kind of are a burden, so let's give you, you know, a way for you not to be a burden. The other reason they give to push this is the same reason why abortion was pushed. It's my body, I should be able to do what I want. That was the argument that helped push abortion on demand. Well, they're using the same arguments. My, my choice, my right. When, when I've gone to um, uh, Beacon Hill, among other people here, to, to testify, you see these compassion and choices people with their buttons on saying, my life, my death, my choice. But this doesn't happen in a vacuum. And as I've already pointed out, that laws to legalize physician assisted suicide are mainly for white, well insured, well to do, well educated patients. But their choice is putting 
pressure on others to take away their choice. So don't buy this, well, it's just my, my life. First of all, none of us made ourselves, whether you believe we are children of God or we just emerged from the primordial soup. We, all of us can say, we didn't make ourselves. So we should just logically, philosophically, you should say, we shouldn't, we didn't make ourselves, we don't really have the right to take ourselves away. You know, if you make something, if you make something, you can break it. But we didn't make ourselves. So philosophically, you know, we should, we can say that, um, that that is a reason not to allow physician assisted suicide. Because it's not just my life. I didn't put myself here. And it's not just my death, because it's going to put pressure on other people for them to um, bring about their own death. And it's not just my choice. It's putting pressure on the society so that they won't have a choice. Yes? So do you think it's um, a lack of belief in God that people take their life because there's no purpose to live? There's no yeah, I think that's a big part of it. That's a big part of it. Uh, they don't see, you know, we, we as, we as uh, Christians, and you, you'll, you'll, you'll see that, you know, I haven't used one religious argument yet. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't really you know, plan to when I go out and, and talk in a, in a secular setting, and I want to give people arguments to, um, to bring up to, their, to other people to try to convince them that this isn't the way to go. But we, we believe that suffering has a meaning. We believe that we can join our suffering to the to the cross and help in redemption of other people, and not just in, in the purely religious way, but it's it's a it's a witness to help us have the strength to live our own lives and to get through suffering. I, th I think of people like um, Saint uh, like Pope Saint John Paul II with his uh, Parkinson's disease. He was really suffering at the end, but he demonstrated how to suffer and how to live through that suffering and to show that that suffering has meaning. I, I, I forget which movie it was about the crucifixion, but um, I don't know if it was The Passion of the Christ. Or, but there's this one scene that really struck me where, where Jesus is given his cross, and as he's carrying the cross, he kisses so he didn't run from the suffering, he embraced the suffering because this is how he saved us all. So we, you know, as, as believers, you know, have that extra dimension to, to fight something like this. But there are plenty of just humanistic, secular arguments uh, to make about this. This is the second time you'll see this slide because I want to bring it home again. That our legislatures are not uh, the legislators are not up there just to give this person a right, that person a right, this person over here a right. They're there to make general laws for us all and to to uh, promote the general welfare. So again, laws that advantage the white, wealthy, the well insured should not be made at the expense of the poor, people of color, the dispossessed, the disabled, because they are the ones who will lose their choice and will be steered toward assisted suicide. Because again, once physician-assisted suicide becomes legal, it becomes a medical procedure. It becomes a cheap medical procedure. And governments want to take the cheap way out, and insurance companies want to take the cheap way out. Now the other thing we want to be aware of is these proposed bills have these euphemistic names on them, like death with dignity. One of the iterations of, this, of these bills was the Death with Dignity Act. Well, there is nothing dignified about suicide. And there's nothing dignified about a physician killing his patient. This uh, latest one, I think, is they call it aid in dying. Well, it's not aid in dying. When you write a prescription, give the prescription to the patient, they go buy a hundred pills, they go home and take it and die. That's not aid. That's, that's abandonment. 
So the uh, dangers in the, in the Massachusetts bill, this pertains to the last iteration. There was no waiting period. I think this latest er uh, iteration of the bill, they put back in a, a waiting period. You know, big deal, so you can wait, you can ask to uh, have a lethal prescription after two weeks. But in that bill, 1991, that I showed you, the prescription can be written uh, on the day of the diagnosis, and the prescription can be filled. These bills do not require uh, counseling. It is not mandated. It is suggested. But even if a psychologist sees the, the patient, they're not, at, they're not obligated to treat the patient for his depression. All they're obligated to do is say, yes, this patient's depressed, but he or she understands what he's doing. So yeah, it's okay to give this person uh, pills to kill themselves. These bills say the person has to be terminally ill, uh, defined as death within six months, but doctors are often wrong. We're not perfect at saying, yeah, you've got six months to live. I've had plenty of cases where I think the person probably does, and I never say, you have six months to live. You know, I'll say, well, these are the ranges we're talking about, but nobody really knows, and you know, you can't, you know, we're not God. Um, I remember testifying one a few years ago, and one person went up to testify and said, I was given a terminal diagnosis 23 years ago, and I'm still here. So we're not, we're definitely often wrong in making these kind of predictions. These bills uh, say that an heir uh, can be a witness or can witness the uh, patient's request. So they, they say that this person who's going to die, you know, they have to ask for the pill, they have to ask again in two weeks, they uh, have to, they maybe can have a psychologist talk to them, uh, they have to have six months to live, and there has to be two witnesses. And one of the witnesses, as in the case of of this um, daughter of Kate Cheney that I showed you, could be an heir. It, it seems absurd to, to allow a person to witness this who has, who has something to gain by this person's death. Uh, a healthcare agent might be able to uh, request the prescription, not the patient himself if they can't um, ask it of themselves. Choice is an illusion. If passed, patient choice would be reduced. A doctor must discuss feasible alternatives, including <laughs> palliative care. Palliative care is just care to take care of the suffering, but it doesn't cure. But uh, options do not mean that the patient can access these, and that insurance will pay. So yeah, it's all well and good to say, to talk about options, but if the state won't pay for it, and the insurance company won't pay for it, then there really are no uh, options. Because again, the state and the insurance companies will often focus on the cheaper options. There's no protections for the uh, person once the assisted suicide prescription is filled. So the doctor writes a prescription, they go home, it's on the shelf, it could stay there for, for months or years. And it's possible that the person could be given this drug inadvertently, could be pressured to be uh, to uh, take it. So there is no safeguard at the time the patient takes the drug, and the patient could be coerced to take these drugs. Second opinion is not really a safeguard. I knew uh, I read a letter that was sent by a doctor in Oregon, sent to the Massachusetts Medical Society to try to make sure Massachusetts Medical Society did not support physician-assisted suicide, which they don't. But he said, oh yeah, I had this patient who had metastatic melanoma, um, terminal cancer, and when he got the diagnosis, he was depressed. Well, who wouldn't be if you just find, found out you're gonna die? So the physician referred this patient to an oncologist, a cancer doctor, to treat this, to try to slow down the disease, try to get some quality of life back. Well, instead, the primary care doctor got a phone call from the cancer doctor and said, um, I talked to this person about physician-assisted suicide, and I want you, primary care doctor, to be my second opinion. And he said, 
Now, I'm not going to consent to that. This is, this is my patient. I've known him a long time. I, I know that he ordinarily wouldn't want to do this, but he just got this diagnosis and he's depressed. So no, I'm not going to be your second opinion. So the cancer doctor found somebody who believed the way he believed, got that person to be the, the second opinion. And the next thing the primary care doctor knew, his patient was dead. So this whole idea of getting a second opinion as a safeguard is absurd. You can always find some hack to to uh, agree with it. Uh, government bureaucrats and health insurance programs could cut costs by denying payment for treatment that patients need and want to approve uh, less costly. Uh, this is just assisted suicide like we already discussed. And then uh, th this is another thing that really kills me. Every, you know, when, when a patient of mine dies, I'm presented with a death certificate, and I have to sign the death certificate. It's a legal document. I have to say, this person died from cancer. This person died from heart failure. Well, the law forbids the doctor from writing assisted suicide on the death certificate. You have to write the underlying disease. So in other words, this law mandates that the doctor lie that the doctor basically create a fraudulent document and, and not put down the real cause of death, which was assisted suicide. So the bill, these bills and uh, laws regarding physician-assisted suicide are not about giving patients the right to commit suicide. The bill is about giving doctors the right to kill. This is the preamble of the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. So the key phrase here is promote the general welfare. Our legislators should be told, you need to protect all of us, not just the white, the wealthy, the well-insured. This is the uh, preamble of the Massachusetts Constitution. I won't read that, but the same phrases are in there. Laws for the common good. So that every man may at all times find his security in these laws. So some closing thoughts. This is a woman, Joni Erickson, who had a cervical spine injury and was a quadriplegic. And so she fights against doctor prescribed suicide. And she says it should not be the state's responsibility to help despairing people kill themselves. Rather, Let's channel more effort into improving management therapies into the hospice movement. We have wonderful hospice uh, organizations in this country. There's no reason why people have to uh, suffer uh, severely. Let's lift people out of depression through compassionate support, family assistance, and help. Let's strengthen the cords of compassion that have characterized our nation for so many decades. We must do all we can to protect, defend, and preserve every life. So a quick summary, physician-assisted suicide is dangerous. It's dangerous because patients, patients uh, will lose trust in the doctor. At, at choices at the end of uh, life will be limited because of financial incentives. There'll be coercion by government, insurance, possibly the family. There are, will lead to a lack of appropriate treatment for depression. Safeguards don't work. It's dangerous because it gives doctors too much power. Yeah, it's dangerous for families because families don't need to be uh, informed. So a patient could go into the doctor's office, get a prescription, go home, and kill themselves. And then uh, you know the grand uh, niece or nephew could walk in and find grandma dead. So the, the law does not require family to be uh, notified. And it's not needed because we have, again, we have wonderful palliative care uh, 
in this uh, state and across the country. It removes hope for medical breakthroughs like, like Charlie Gard, like Brittany Maynard. So physician-assisted suicide is dangerous and it must be stopped. 